first question that we normally ask is about the United States, about America in general. So what do you think it means to be American? To be American is a state of mind and that anyone around the world can be American. And it has to do with the ideals uh, that are embedded in our Constitution, uh, that uh, uh, protect the individual and give the individual an opportunity to make good on dreams. We have a system here which for most of the people allows people to have dreams and allows them to think that they can make progress on those dreams if they work hard. And uh, I'd like to have the rest of the world be American in that sense. And what do you think is the biggest threat to the United States right now? That fewer people will have, uh, will be able to hold on to those dreams uh, and uh, that fewer people will, su will support the idea of having a nation that exists with a rule of law that is structured in a way that protects the individual and allows individuals to, um, to have dreams. Looking at uh, the people that have inspired you over the years, who are some of your role models? People in my family, my, uh, my parents, my, grandf my grandparents, um, they were all making their way in the United States. Uh, my family came here a couple hundred years ago, so they're not first generation migrants, but people who, uh, while they were very engaged in the private sector of the United States, were also very committed to social issues, uh, were involved with the, with the racial and desegregation issues in the 1920s and 1930s, as Jews were always dealing with anti-Semitism. There's lots of mythological figures from the, United, the history of the United States that are wonderfully inspiring, like Thomas Jefferson and the words that he put into the Declaration of Independence, and like uh, George Washington and his decision uh, not to be a king, but to really promote the rule of law, and Abraham Lincoln's vision for the United States and other totemic figures. But the ones that impacted me personally were my family. And uh, when did you say your family came to the U.S., and where were they coming from? Beginning of the 19th century. On my father's side, they all came from Germany. On my mother's side, half of them came from Holland, and the other half came from Denmark. Like, as any new immigrants, they sort of found their way and, and uh, founded companies and ran those companies. But my grandfather, for example, was a prominent politician in New York City. Um, he was very involved with the NAACP, um, the, the, the organization that W. Du Bois founded in the early part of the 20th century to fight for racial equality. I think I was a member of it when I was 10 years old. You know, the issues that we're fighting today in terms of uh, the um, unfortunately named War on Terror, um, is the, the fight to, uh, to maintain the individual freedoms and the character of the United States, which is so essential. Do you think the Jewish community feels comfortable in the U.S.? When I was growing up, there was lots of anti-Semitism. I experienced it all the time. In my local community, I never learned golf because there was a Jewish quota in our country club. and. Uh, my father wouldn't join because he didn't countenance those kinds of quotas. Um, there were clubs in my high school that didn't allow Jews. There were fraternities in my college that were re restricted by religion. There is a, a growing feeling of discomfort among Jews because of um, the association of Jews and Jewishness with, the, with, with a supposed callous hegemonic projection of the United States. And um, once again, I think that's something that's manipulated by people. Um, but uh, there's a concern uh, that many Jews feel about um, being vulnerable because of that. Um, in part, that vulnerability comes from memories of the Holocaust. I mean, every Jew lost family members in the Holocaust. Well, it means lots of things. When I was a kid, it was a pedigree. You know, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants would trace their roots back to the Mayflower or something like that and encourage everyone else to assimilate and be like them. So we don't have a nation of assimilation anymore. We have a nation of a, that's a salad bowl or a tapestry where we can all have our identities and enjoy those identities and not have to all become white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. And if it is, it reflects the kind of individuality and eccentricity that is American creativity. Because who were those pilgrims that went to, uh, on the Mayflower? They were crazy religious zealots who left 
of England because they wanted to practice their own brand of religion. Myself don't like a lot of the things that, that they may have done or stood for. It was a pretty severe religion. But individual, creative, um, first uh, one of the first of many uh, unusual individual creative groups that have come to the United States and contribute to this rich ta tapestry that is the United States. So people don't feel the same pressure to assimilate to a kind of American culture, this WASP culture anymore. During the mid part of the 20th century, um, there wasn't the kind of prosperity that there is now. There was the depression. During those kinds of circumstances, it's very easy to stigmatize and stereotype and act against others. And that was one of the things that happened uh, during, the, during the 30s in Europe that led to the, to the uprise of the National Socialist Party and the Nazis in Germany. After World War II, while the depression was over, there wasn't a lot of prosperity. As prosperity grew in the United States, and we were able to pay more and more attention to those ideals and ideas that are the bedrock of our Constitution, I think that uh, it became less and less acceptable to behave in a way that stigmatized other groups. Uh, today, both because of the factors I mentioned before of individuals manipulating categories like Jew, like Muslim, for their own purposes, but also the global financial crisis could result in environmental circumstances that make people feel more uneasy about people that are not like them and might lead them to, to strike out. So it's very important to have leadership that pushes in the other direction for that. And I think that's one of the reasons why people are so hopeful about Obama, because they're hoping that he knows about these things because of his own experience and that he'll be careful to be a kind of leader that makes it difficult to behave in that way. studying Islam in the United States and relations between different groups. After 9-11, we know there was a lot of stereotyping of Muslims and a lot of hatred uh, towards Muslims. The image of Islam was being constructed or seen in a certain way. And how do you feel about that image today? What is the image of Islam like? After 9-11, um, the salience of Islam uh, grew, and it grew in lots of different ways. I mean, I had Muslim friends for a long, long time, and most of them were sort of secular in the way they presented themselves. Uh, after 9-11, uh, a use by some uh, individuals of Islam uh, in a way that was, is very unfortunate to make it appear to be something uh, homogeneous and to, a way to make it to be something violent. In everyday life, Muslims that are in America are Americans. They're treated as Americans by other Americans. They have dreams that they're working to. To, to fulfill. Other Americans have those dreams and they're happy that the Muslims that they know have dreams. When we begin to generalize, then uh, we create a self-fulfilling prophecy that the other is impossible to deal with. And sometimes that other can become impossible to deal with if we create that kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. If on the other hand we recognize the variety and the multiplicity of roles that individuals have, we can create pretty wonderful things.